Hey, we're doing a study on the, the book of Jonah. This is part two. Uh, we're basically uh, in the book of Jonah, God tells Jonah to go and convert a bunch of terrorists. He sends them to Assyria, uh, which was a terrorist state at the time, much like ISIS is today. So it's the equivalent of, of God telling us to go over to Iraq and, and convert a bunch of ISIS terrorists to uh, love Jesus and become good people. Uh, we wouldn't want to do it today. Jonah didn't want to do it back then. He said no. God sent him that way. Jonah went that way instead. And... Um, well, he got caught up in a storm, which is uh, the point of today's study. Chapter 1, verse 4 says, But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. What we need to see from this is that all sin has a storm attached to it, right? which is what Jonah did, and it's what we do, right? When we are supposed to go this way and we go that way, we know God wants us heading this direction, but we find a boat to go that way. That, that's what sin is, going the opposite direction of God. Uh, Jonah did that here, and he quickly learned that all sin has a storm attached to it. Now, that is not me saying that every storm in your life is the result of sin. That's not the case. We live in a fallen world that's full of storms and scary times. Uh, not all storms in your life are a result of sin, but all sin does have a storm attached to it. Uh, all of our bad decisions have bad consequences. They just, they just always do. Right? You can't neglect your body forever and expect to be healthy. You can't neglect your spouse and expect to have a, a good marriage. Um, all sin has a storm attached to it. Uh, now, sin is a, not a very popular topic. So while I'm on this topic, I want to say one more thing about it before we move on. And that is that sin is uh, it's self-destructive. It's really what I want us to understand about it. Sin is spiritual suicide. It does violence to our soul by getting us to act against our own self-interests. Um, every form of sin at the beginning feels good. Right? That's why we do it. Nobody sins because it's not fun. Um, we do it because we think God does not have our best interest at heart and we're going to miss out on something if we don't go this way when he's trying to send us that way. And initially that way feels good. Uh, and so we go that way and it becomes addicting and um, we chase it further and further. Uh, but all sin has a storm attached to it. And that storm really is against our own self-interest. Right? It's, it's doing violence to our soul. That's all I'll say about sin, and we'll, go, we'll move on. Uh, in this case, Jonah's sin, however, is that he didn't trust God's command for him to go love his neighbor. Now, he sent them to Assyria to love these people, and uh, Jonah just didn't trust that that was a good thing to do. Um, probably the biggest reason why we'll see in the book as this unfolds is that Jonah's neighbors didn't look like him. They were evil. They didn't act like him. They didn't look like him. They didn't believe the same things he believed. And so because of that, Jonah did not see in his neighbor any capacity for goodness. He didn't think that they deserved it. And so he told God, no, I'm not going to do it. Now, before we get all judgy and condemn Jonah for being discriminatory, we need to realize that in some area, all of us have a category of those people. You know what I mean? Like for Jonah, the Assyrians were those people. But we all have some category of people that we rationalize being mean to, or at least not loving in a way that we know we should, right? That's those people. And if we're really honest, we're happy that God created hell so that those people have a place to go to because us and our people are going over here and those people belong over there. Uh, so who are your those people? Who are they for you? The people that you just rationalize not being kind to and not being loving towards. That's what those people are. Uh, what we need to learn and what Jonah learned in this book is that the theme of it is, is we have a God who is willing and loving enough to pursue all people even those people. And uh, Jonah learned that through his interaction with the other sailors on the boat. Uh, as we keep reading, we read, Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. You know, it's a, it's a scary storm when professional sailors who live at sea are throwing their profits overboard and basically burning their business to the ground because they're so afraid of this tempestuous storm. You know, it's a big deal. Very scary. So they're doing that, but we keep reading. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this, he shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. All right. Now, what I want us to notice about this is the unbelieving those people. Right, the pagan sailors on the boat, who are very much not like Jonah, they're the ones who are really calling the missionary in this story to do his job and be a better person. If you pay attention to the text and look, look closely. Um, they're the ones who tell Jonah to get up and pray. Right? And if, if you're looking really closely, you'll see that the very same words they use 
where they say, Arise and call on your God. It's the exact same Hebrew phrase that God used in verse 2 to speak to Jonah. So very much to Jonah's prejudicial surprise, he's hearing the words of his God in the mouth of those people that he categor like, categorically just looks down upon. Now, I want to use that to, to finish here, this short video, by saying something directly to the Christians. So if you're not a Christian, feel free to tune me out for this last part of the video. But to my fellow believers in Jesus, like fellow disciples of Christ, um, I want to say that the criticisms here of the sailors towards Jonah have a lot to teach us. Because we can expect the rest of the world outside of the church to have a reasonable expectation for us, Christians, to act in their best interest. We can expect the rest of the world to want us to serve and love them in a good way. Like they were warranted in criticizing Jonah and waking him up in the same way that the world would be warranted in waking us up as Christians and saying, hey, why aren't you seeking my welfare? Why aren't you trying to serve me and love me in a tangible way? Doesn't the God whom you serve, I think his name's Jesus, right? Doesn't he tell you through his words and his deeds that you're supposed to love your neighbor? And if I read that correctly, there's no qualification on that. He doesn't have any category of neighbor that you don't have to love. It's very true. That's what we're called to do. And so I want to, to wrap this up by telling the Christians to go home, love your Muslim neighbor, like, tangibly love her, serve her in a way that means something to her, and, and love your gay neighbor, and love your straight neighbor, love your conservative neighbor, and hug your liberal neighbor, love your black neighbor, and love your white neighbor. That's what we're called to do. And what Jonah teaches us here is that we are all in the same boat together.